his uh, lessons assistance at various times in the uh, rest of his career, in our career. Uh, I think we should start with, with Mike Boyer. Mike might give a little introduction uh, because he was the first of us to uh, work with Russ. Yeah, I picked up my family, a wife and three little kids, and moved to Southern California because I got a letter from Russ Manning, who I'd sent some comic book samples to, and said, you know, if I ever need an assistant, you could probably do the work. So I told the place I worked, I was going on a month's vacation, moved out of the house, put everything in storage, and moved to Southern California, showed us at Russ's door, and said, well, here I am. He said, well, for what? <laughs> <laughs> And out of the kindness of his heart, he put me to work as his assistant. And the first thing I did was aliens, the aliens the pictures to? in the back of the magnets. Where, where did you move from? I moved from the Willamette Valley in Oregon, really down to Lebanon. And that was in April of 1965. And I guess luck was with me because I went to work assisting Russ, and within a year's time, his work had become so popular in comics fandom that Western Publishing, the company producing the editorial material for Gold Key Comics, said, we want more work from Russ Manning. And Russ Manning told them that the only way that they could get more work out of him was for me to assist him on everything and for them to give me work so that I would always be available so that I was working full time. So they called me and said, come in and we'll give you work. So I, Fortunately, I never had to show them samples, because if I had, I probably would have never gotten a job. <laughs> How long did you work on that assembly from David? Oh, I was thinking about that the other night. Um, when he got the strip, I know I was involved from Sunday number one, but I believe he started the daily weeks or months before he took over the Sunday strip. There was an, uh, uh, an artist who I don't remember any more than I think his name was Joe, who was a friend of Russ's, lived in Orange County, and he did some assisting backgrounding and so on. What I found valuable in working for Russ is that I've heard people use the term assistant and most people think that's just thinking and lettering, but I think we can all attest to the fact that in assisting Russ Manning, we would be given a page where half of it would be type pencil and half of it would be inked. So our jobs as assistants were to finish pencils and to ink so that when it was finished, you'd look at the page and you could not tell that anyone other than Russ had touched it. It, it was less being an assistant, it was more like an apprenticeship program. You're right. Everything I know as an artist today, and for 20 years I've done Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Wayne and Tigger, believe it or not, everything I learned about design started with that apprenticeship with Russ Manning. Yeah, that was one of Russ's real strengths as an artist. He was a tremendous designer. And he learned a lot of his design uh, when he was in the Navy when he was stationed in Japan and got introduced to Japanese prints. And, uh, Russ was the one who turned me on to Japanese prints as well, and I learned a lot of my design sense from, from looking at Japanese prints. I worked on the, the strip with Russ in uh, the early 70s, and uh, worked on both the Sundays and dailies, and uh, did inking and, and color on the Sundays, and also worked with Russ on uh, some graphic novels as well. And I was the line of time job, talking to full time, and, and there was one after that. And then uh, Dave uh, worked with Russ after me. When was that, Dave? How did that, that come about? It was uh, summer of uh, 1975. Um, I had met Russ about a year or two before on a little trip with several of the guys from San Diego County Conventions. I was in San Diego for about three or four years. And, uh, um, he'd seen my samples, but his opinion of what I was doing was, well, it's Marvel style, and it's not what I wanted. And, and I was hoping, secretly, I didn't ask at the time, but I was hoping that maybe he'd have something to throw me on. And uh, he just made it real clear that he didn't like that slave-off thinking style. I don't know that's kind of what it did. I 
I didn't understand it myself. But about, uh, about a year after I went up there, he called Shell Dora, who was the Dante unit, and asked him who he could recommend because he was on national needs. He held down on some of the work he was doing with sons. And I don't know about the baby. I don't know if the baby was there. I think the baby was continuing. I think Bill worked on the last well, alias, which was the blue scarf. So yeah, I worked on the last dailies and uh, the very last dailies. Russ did completely stuff that he wanted to. He wanted the very last daily to be all his. But I, I ain't up to the deal. I don't want to interrupt Dave, but I've always been jealous of this guy. He is so extremely talented. And for years, I would sit in Russ's studio and go, Russ, I would use the term we. For some reason, I said, "Why don't we take Tarzan back to Lucidog?" So by the time that I left to go to work with Jack Kirby, <coughs> Russ said, "I'm going to take Tarzan to Lucidog," <laughs> and this guy got to work on all of it. I'm leading you out, <laughs> Dave. When you when you was assisting him on the on the strip, was that before or after uh, you were doing some of the Tarzan stuff for the Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated comics? Uh, that was before, um, and, and I ended up doing work for them because of uh, the Sunday page, uh, and I was still doing work the Sunday page at the same time. So uh, what happened was he, he hired me, but it, it was only because I, I kind of persisted. He didn't want to hire me. He, uh, what I was about to say was he called Shell Lord and asked me for recommendations for you guys to help out and uh, show him a, name, a list of three or four guys that he knew of, but he, he asked, he, he mentioned me first, and I said, no, no, this team, this team, Jack Kirby. And Shell called me and said, well, look, you know, I, I mentioned your name, but he wasn't interested. And so I wrote him a letter and then did a couple of drawings of Tarzan and a couple of gorillas and sent them to him. And he, he called my, uh, my folks' house while I was out of town. And, uh, <laughs> he tracked me down in, in L.A. I was, I was up there for some... Uh, it might have even been uh, for the Dumb Dumb in 1975, so I bet that's what it was. And uh, he, he located me and had me stop at his place on the way back to San Diego and pick up my first Sunday page and took off with it that day. So, with Russ, it was always a, a crunch. You know, there was always a little bit of desperation to the... I mean, I, I thought it was great. I, I was up for it. And, uh, but we were always, it was always the 11th hour. Um, he was always getting me things right at the last minute. And it was just sweat and bullets. Kind of just the race, the race to make that thing. Well, yeah. Now, with both you guys, when, when you were working with him, was it basically the same as, as Mike stated, where you, you get a page that was tightly penciled and partially inked, and you just expected to more or less was there some kind of thing uh, Very little for me at first, and a lot toward the end. Or, or, like, or like, did he did he want something to? Well, I want to do the heads. I want to finish all the heads. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like he, would, he would always ink parts. He he'd, he'd occasionally let us ink parts of the body, but never the face. That was always his domain. And then and then he'd be working there, and and suddenly an alarm would go off. And he'd jump up and race to his truck because he was a volunteer fireman. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I just keep running, you know, pretty soon he'd come back. <laughs> of all the professional cartoonists that I've known in, in, since 1965, Russ Manning was probably, and I put this in quotes, the most normal guy I've ever met. Russ lived. I have been up in a long time, but Majeska Canyon, outside of the town of Orange, in those days, was out in the wilderness. She went a little further along the road, and it ended, and there was a fish, fish hatcher. Very rural. They had a volunteer fire department, and Russ was very involved in his community. And he ran for a little walk. Yeah. But, but Russ, uh, uh, Russ was probably the most normal cartoonist I've ever met. He was really involved in his community. He was a loser. Uh, it was probably the closest to what, if you want to use the term that you very loose with these days, hero. Russ comes very close to that because this is a guy who would risk his life to save people from cars that were driven over a ditch into a canyon or a trap. 
Hmm? Oh, glue. You poked him back with it. Oh, really? Got glue? <laughs> 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 and all Russ would ever say about it later was one thousand dollars very crap. You know, Russ was, was, in my opinion, one of the hardest guys to ever get original art from of anybody I ever ran across. I, never I, I mean, one. I mean, I don't mean like like going up and asking him for a sketch or anything. I mean buying a piece. I mean, being willing to pay for it. Well, all the years he, he just, worked for Western Publishing, he just didn't want to let go of anything. Now, I keep hearing that, but there, I was working one day, and I was thinking, I go, Russ, I'm not going to get a piece of your original art. And, <laughs> and uh, I hear this little scratching sound, and then he hands me this. <laughs> and I was like, I was laughing at it. <laughs> In the last year of the strip, I guess it's safe to say this now, the last year of the Sunday strip, since all of the original art, for some reason, contractually, was the property of Edgar S. Grills Incorporated, Russ wanted to have one of his Sunday originals. So the ritual was, when the strips were finished, he would have negatives and stats made, and it'd all be bundled up, and I'd take it to the post office on my way home with the completion of the week's work. So on this one Sunday that he decided that he wanted to keep, which was a beautiful piece, a great big splash panel, one of those girls with the tail. And uh, unfortunately, the cat that stayed in his studio knocked a pot of coffee over on it. So he had to send the syndicate a stat. And that same cat, mysteriously, on the very last Sunday page, which I penciled and inked over his tissue ruffs, about cats going to the house. How smart was he getting? That's why those two pages are not the property of Edgar S. Burroughs and Park. Along the lines of Russ being a hero, Russ was, was my role model as a father. Which, uh, my own father uh, got divorced when I was 14. So I watched the way that Russ raised his children. He was such a wonderful father. That's really where I learned my parents' skills. He was really a good guy that was Yeah. He was also had this, this sort of Albert Schweitzer streak to him as well. It really pained him to kill any living creature. I mean, I remember him going through just agony because he had termites in his studio and he, and he had to kill the termites. It was just, just heartbroken that he had to do that. And I remember one, one time the ants had made it to the studio, there was like a big line of ants going across the floor, you know, and he made sure that, you know, I was real careful not to step on it. He didn't want to disturb her little life. And, and some of that spilled into the Tarzan strip as well, Tarzan's respect for animals. Was he temperamental in any way? I mean, could things set him off? Or? Boy, I didn't notice that. I didn't, you know, <laughs> When I, when I first started inking, I, I would always dread the sound of that electric eraser. You know, I, I finished shaking up. I hand it to him, and then I hear. Take it off everything that you had just done. I think he did it to me a lot more than you. Oh, 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 oh. I'm just like, oh. I like would slap ink all over it. I, I, I knew I was costing him time. Oh, God, that's so horrible. I think Russ was the kind of an artist that really, truly didn't like to let go of one pen stroke or one brush stroke, but he realized that he couldn't do it all. The constraints of the deadlines, he couldn't do it all. And I can remember once penciling and inking a four-page Tarzan story for Goatee, a filler, and showed him the originals. And the page, the panel that he had the most problems with, one that I had literally blown up and traced off of his proofs. <laughs> so it was absolutely a pure Russ Manny head. But he had a problem with it, and I think it was probably because it just didn't come from his hand. We, we had arguments on storytelling on some of the, the stories that I did during that whole Burroughs publishing comic thing in 75. And what I have done, I think, worked very well, and several people said so, but I think Russ's problem was it was not the way he would have done it. 
And I respected that. And uh, I don't know how you guys were as far as getting compliments from Russ, but the nicest thing Russ ever said about me was to Richard Kyle, his last days in the hospital, when he said, Mike will do okay. <laughs> 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 well, Mike, with you, with you working with him the longest, did he ever say anything about Amy and Jesse Martin starting for, uh, for a short period? Probably around 52 or 53. Did he only do, he only eat one story, didn't he? If that. I know that he had tremendous respect for Jesse. Yeah, he had a beautiful life drawn by Jesse in the studio. And that's the one where, in reality, your arm would be 12 feet long, but it's so beautiful. I mean, but as an artist, Jesse, it worked. It was perfect. I heard a lot from Russ about it works. That was mostly what I heard. But I also realized that it was very, I think it was very hard for him to let go because it was his creation. And he had worked hard to get to that point. He's an artist who might have held this malice towards the Marvel and DC look because many times he had submitted his artwork, his samples, to DC. And their, res and their response was, no, this is not what we're looking for. It's not superhero enough or, or whatever the explanation was. And, I, and, and for the life of me, being rejected by Carmine Infantino doesn't mean that you've been rejected. <laughs> he, he also has an issue with Marvel's treatment of Conan. And, and I, it seems to me that I recall him saying that he had approached him to do it himself. Hmm. Please you speak up. Wow. Pardon? He'd approached Marvel. Yeah, here you go. No. Russ had approached yeah, Marvel to do Conan. Examples? You know, I'm sure there may have been, but I never saw them. I just remember him talking to me about it, kind of grumbling. When, when Barry Smith's version did go out, he just thought it was just miserable stuff. You know, he also heard at one point that how Boston was looking for his system on the first value. He worked up for a whole lot of samples and sent to Boston to him to, to get to work with him on the post. Boston was his, his idol. I wonder what became of the samples. I've never seen I that. No. I, don't, I, I never heard whether Foster had sent him back to him or, or not. He was also contacted about doing a Brothers of the Spear Sunday strip. And, uh, and he turned that over to me. He did layouts, and then I, I did uh, penciling and inking. And uh, he was horrified it looked like my stuff. <laughs> 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 he, he thought I was going to turn around and do it his style. And, and I thought, well, he was giving me the job so that I could you know, have my own Sunday strip. It wasn't the way it was. <laughs> I wonder what he thought of Jesse Santos's Brothers of the Spirit comic. Yeah. Although, although you know, he plotted the first issue of that. Yeah. But, well, I, I think that, that Russ may have had the same opinion of someone else doing a character he'd worked on the same way that Jack Kirby did, is that if Russ had given you his layouts, he wanted to come back looking like Russ. But if somebody else had done it without any artistic input from him, he would look at it then as what that artist had done and evaluate it from that standpoint, his storytelling and, and, and anatomy and so on. However, but I think if it was something, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, a, a good case in point proving, this proving that, is that Mike Plume did one of those stories for the European edition. And Russ literally pasted a panel after panel over what Mike had done before he would allow me to literally half of each page was gone. Well, but I think that's the case that Russ was the editor-in-chief. He yeah, made up so those huge standard model sheets of yeah. all the characters. Yeah, and Blue Stars and didn't really bear up a lot of resemblance. I mean, generally, it looked like they're not enough. I'd always and wondered I what the problem was with Alex and him over the last graphic novel. And I just recently heard from someone who had heard this from Alex that Russ was disappointed that Alex's Tarzan wasn't tall enough. Yeah, his, his Tarzan was too short. I, I was there when Eric came in, and uh, I was real excited to see him. I was like, wow, huge Alex Tarzan. And uh, I was shocked at how poor the storytelling was on a couple of pages. And, and I could see why Russ had to redraw it, because they were just, they were dead. My 
my problem is I wrote pages 11 through 46 of that book, and I've never seen it. If you've got a copy of it in Italian or Spanish <laughs> or French, I'd love to see it. Now, I, I wrote to Alex Dahl and, and asked him about him working on that particular book, you know, and, and he responded with uh, uh, great vehemence against Russ. You know, the Russ, he, he just didn't understand the, the right way of storytelling, you know. And, well, there you've got another personality, though, that, if, you know, Russ, I think Russ really didn't appreciate it if it didn't come from his hand. Right. And he was disappointed at the treatment he'd got from submitting to DC and Marvel. At the same point, from the beginning of Alex Toth's career, people criticized his work, editors, because it didn't look like Alex Raymond. So Toth hates anything, anything that remotely resembles the Alex Raymond school, which is why he would not like Russ's Tarzan. I remember Alex telling me when he got the model sheets from Russ, he says, what the hell? He says, he's mad at me because my Tarzan doesn't look like a Tarzan. Every one of his Tarzans looks different. <laughs> well, yes and no. So it, it was an interesting experiment. Now, at the time that the, 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 they were done, the, the Ed Rush Bros. Incorporated European comics, Russ also did a series of pet food ads. Did you guys work on any of those with him? Yeah. yeah. With Tarzan, I mean, it was all with Tarzan, but it was showing, it was showing dogs Maybe. and cats and stuff Maybe. for yes. for this pet food. But they've never been, they've never been published. But uh, you know, I worked with Russ on some uh, movie advertisements where they had like uh, little short comic book sort of teasers for movies. One was Luana, just uh, Luana, Luana the the Invasion of the Spider. Super yeah, Didn't Russ also do a um, an advertisement for the Aurora dinosaur models? Tiny Tarzan. <coughs> Tarzan slips through a time hole and the That was Cubert. Is it Cubert? Yeah. No, for the old no, it's Neil Adams. Neil Adams, you might. Yeah, I mean Neil Adams. Well, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, work on the uh, Magnus with him? I did. Starting with issue number 12, which I said earlier, I in that first issue 12, uh, I inked all of the aliens in the four-page backup story. And, uh, and then from that point on, I worked on every Magnus, and it was a case of, of I I'd get pages that were partially finished, and I either would finish penciling to match his and then ink it. So I, I recently discovered at my mother's house when I was cleaning up after she died and found a book that I sent her, which I had had hard found the first year of my work with Russ, and it was simply titled First Year Apprenticeship. And I look at that stuff, and I, I remember those pages, but I can't find what I did on it. <laughs> Which I guess was what it was supposed to be. Yeah. You know. Did you guys work on the comic books at all? The the the, the gold key. Uh, oh, that's that's the that was before. That was before you worked. I'm, I'm the old codger up I worked on all that. You worked on all the comic books. books. On the yeah. first adaptations. Yeah. Now, now, Russ did all those adaptations. Himself. Yeah, his first full Tarzan comic was before the adaptations, and it was one where some astronauts crash in the jungle or something. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then. Uh, they said, we want to adapt the books, and he thought that was a great idea. And as a result of how well those books looked and did, then the Burroughs people said, we need to get this artist doing the Sunday strip. Yeah. And uh, I, su I suppose there are two camps on John Salardo. Uh, I don't hold it against John that after 900 years of doing the strip, he was tired of it. All most people saw was his Sunday script, which uh, he spent the least amount of time on. If anyone saw the last day of the continuity that John Salardo did, which uh, involved uh, twigging, I say that in quotes, the, the, the heroine of the script is, is absolutely twiggy. But we're talking 1967, 68. Uh, he was working very hard on the David script. Mm -hmm. I, I worked on all those Tarzan comics, the Magnuses. Vincent, you were mentioning earlier Magnus's relationship to Tarzan. Magnus is, is Tarzan in the year 4000. Mm -hmm. 
that's what it was from the beginning. I don't know if it was Russ's idea Thank or Chase Craig's the editor or whether they are having a meeting talking about new titles. Mm -hmm. And uh, but basically, that's uh, I think Russ uh, was destined to do Tarzan, even if he had to do a lot of other things for a, a decade and a half before that. But you look at his very first pages in 1952, his Brothers of the Spear, heavily influenced by Foster, you can still see that this is a guy that should be doing You know, one of his uh, stories for one of the cars and annuals in the 50s was called Cars and the Dinosaur with the Heart. Is is one of the absolute best cars stories that Russ ever ever and he wrote it also. Yeah, he's really underappreciated as a writer. Yeah. One hand, so yeah. I've seen a hand raised many times in the back. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to ask you where uh, where you got the idea for the Wizard of Venus. What does the in 20 seconds. <laughs> Believe me, I've learned a couple of things about coins. <laughs> yes, I understand that. But Where did I come a, up with the idea? Well, I'll tell you what it amounted to. In 1964, I don't know when, when the Magnus Comics premiered, but this was the first time Russ was allowed to sign something. So there was now a name to this person. And at the same time, I discovered Burroughs' fandom through the hot ads in Famous Monsters magazine. And I joined the, the bibliophiles and, and subscribed to Chaz Sue's magazine, uh, Urban, and found out that Russ was a Burroughs fan. Being a fanboy at the time, I assumed, well, if you're a fan of Tarzan, of course, no matter where you live, in 64, you will show up at the Dum Dum at the World Science Fiction Con in Oakland. So, I don't know how I met Dale Broadhurst, but we, I wanted to do a comic book, something, a reason to go to the convention, and I knew for sure that Russ would be there, and then I would get to meet this comic book artist whose work I loved, but I never knew what his name was. And that's how Wizard of Venus came about. Uh, Russ didn't go to the Dumb now. He <laughs> was a very regular private guy that fought fires and and rescued people's lives and drew comic books and lived out in the country with his family. And uh, did Russ ever go to a downtown? What, 74 or 75? 75, he was there. 75. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that's one of my treasured possessions. I asked Albert Burroughs for permission and he said <laughs> you could print up, up, up to 200 copies. And I, I said, well, now exactly 200. So anywhere between 150 and a million. <laughs> That sounds right. Did you ever finish it? Did I the is, wizard. It's not finished? No, I the one I had wasn't, so I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is finished. They're selling the last page. <laughs> well, you, know, you said that Maddie didn't sign any stuff, but I remember in all the old westerns that he did, he would have the name on a building would be Manning. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, but you see, I was just a dumb kid reading comic books in those days. Well, I was 17 years younger than Russ. I think it was 17. And so I didn't know that the signs on the streets and why it hurt was the artist's name. Well, maybe if I had collected everything and had this cumulative effect of seeing it on the, on the back of boats, you know, and on the street signs, and of course I wasn't clever enough to find the little RMs that were there occasionally. Uh, probably this wasn't very bright. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of artists find that it's really hard to do the female form and the male form, and I thought that Russ handled the female form with a lot of classroom. He was deft in how he's, he delivered classic poses. How did he do that? I was still trying to figure it out. Oh, the whole, whole, whole. Well, Dave does a pretty good job. Was there some significance in that some daily panels had the RM and some had Russ Manning? I think I think Russ had a strong ego. However, as an artist. <coughs> If the whole Russ Manning wouldn't fit, he would put R.M. The art was what was important. 
So that's that's the significant difference. An RM, there wasn't room for him to write Russ Manning. <laughs> Did Bill Key have a policy against the artist's signing? <laughs> yes. And, and I think Russ was the one that broke the mold. And I don't even know why he was allowed to sign the first magnets. Perhaps because he wrote it and so much of it was his idea. Maybe we got a lot of mail. Well, we what if a lot of mail from the first issue? Oh, yeah. But because he signed it, or else Chase was asleep at the, at the switch, <laughs> which if he had been more often, that would have been better books. <laughs> now, I had heard that the, that the West Coast offices of Western had an absolute abhorrence against any of the artists signing their names, but that the East Coast didn't have quite the prejudice against that. As well, I don't remember any of the East Coast books being signed in those days, late 50s, early 60s. Do you guys? No, because I've got some. You guys were too young then. George Evans and those other stuff that was under sign. Oh yeah, Al Williamson, Wally Wood, all those guys worked in Ripley's Believe or Not, so right. those kinds of things. Of course, the first art right. stories that Jesse Marsh did, he signed these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Can you and guys tell us a little, right. a little about the writing process? Did Russ type up a script? Did he do handwritten notes? Or did he just storyboard it? How did he come up with these stories? Well, I can tell you that from my experience with Russ in the comic books, uh, Gold Key Comics may not have the revered stature that Marvel and DC have in some circles. However, I've always believed that the way that they wrote comics were the best way. If you, as an artist, if you've ever worked for any of the people that work for Marvel, they give you a script and it says page one, panel one, and it goes on and on and on, and you find you've got a nine panel page with 75 soliloquies, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to put the art in. Or, they describe this stuff, you do a 12-panel page, and then Roy Thomas puts in every word he can find in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> the way Western Publishing wrote comic books is the scripter took a piece of typing paper, ruled off the, the panels, and then typed the, the dialogue and the description. And that way you found out if you had too darn much material. Now, when I, I, I did a 46-page album during the Burroughs Publishing thing, which at this point in time, I say, thank God they never printed it. But I think it was well written and well laid out. But I, I did it the Western Publishing way, except I thumbnail boarded it. Same thing on the, the 36 pages I did in the Tarzan and Savage Pellucidar for Russ. He gave me a very brief outline of the material, how he would like to continue the story he did with the first 11 pages. And I wrote it, drew the panels, typed in the material, and then did little, little thumbnail silhouettes and so on. And I've only seen a handful of pages, and one day I'd love to see the whole book and see whether he liked my layouts or not. <laughs> whether they were done, because I still have all that stuff. Somebody might have it in the room. Well, I saw one book that, that Korak is in a great deal of the story. That uh, one of the books I think you worked on, but there were six or eight pages that uh, I think it was about at the time I think when your interest and career were going a little different direction, and uh, Russ and I had been estranged for a while. Uh, I don't know why. I guess because I went to work with Kirby. <laughs> now that's fun to set up a panel at a WesterCon science fiction convention. I'm here, here's Russ, and here's Jack. And to see two guys who didn't like each other's approach to drawing, but from a designing standpoint, were two of the best designers that ever did comic books. This is Tarzan related. I know we're here to talk about Russ, but the most interesting moment I ever had in my life was with Jack Kirby and Vern Hogarth. Oh Ninety God. minutes of sitting with these two oh, guys okay, while they sure. argue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they argued like crazy over lunch, and I just sat there and laughed because I'm going, you're both saying the same damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you remember that. Bill and I 
I shared a studio for about five years uh, in the early 80s. And around 81 or 82, I decided that I wanted to take Hogarth's drawing class, his finger class at Otis Parsons. And I, I, I only lasted about four weeks. But uh, we used to call him, get him to Tom Hogarth, because he would get up there and rail like Billy Sunday. Just, I mean, it was, it was more fun for me just to go and sit and listen to him. He'd get yeah. beat red and scream his head off about philosophy and art history and everything in the world that, that you really should know at least this much of. And, and then the rest of the time we were sort of sitting there shell-shocked and sweating and, and trying to figure out what he just said and what he had to do with drawing it. Well, I think that everything, I think Hogarth had an influence on Russ, not necessarily from a drawing standpoint, but I can... The excitement of it. Well, the excitement, the dynamics, the, the, the power. The clean. But just before he started doing the strip, I had acquired a collection of like 200 half-page Hogarths in a row, which I put in these expensive presentation albums. And I obviously wanted to show them to Russ. And he would look at these things. He said, the only problem with these pages is when they're in a collection like this. After four weeks, you're worn out. <laughs> now, I think that influenced Russ from, in a way, in how he did his story. Because I think there was part of Russ that always wanted his stuff to be collected in book form. And if you look at Russ's, even the most dynamic page after page, you don't get the same feeling of, I'm getting tired of this. As you yeah, with Burns' work. And that's not to denigrate Burns' work, it's just, I, so that's an interesting story to go along with that. Uh, I've got copies of letters that Russ wrote to Burns Boreal in the late 40s and early 50s. And he had basically discovered, discovered Burn Hogarth's Tarzan. And, and in these letters, he is absolutely just raving <laughs> over, over what, this. What time period is this? The late 40s, early 50s. I, I mean, he is raving over, over Burns' Tarzan work. It's interesting because he, he had a Hogarth original on the wall. And one day I was admiring it, and I just started to gush a little too much. <laughs> 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 and, but it, it wasn't, it was. And I was comparing it to, to Foster and, and saying, well, you know, you know, Foster tries it, obviously, to handle it. And just lets down his pants. And he starts pulling out drawer after drawer of these absolutely stunning Foster Sundays that he had in the And I was just like, shut my mouth. Did you read it? We had to see it. It was like, it was devastating. And, and it was what started me collecting Foster. And I'm looking at this stuff, I'm like, oh my, this is. I mean, Hogarth doesn't even come close. <laughs> there was no question. And, and Russ really did the same thing. He just kept showing me page after page when he sat back. Well, Hogarth was the only one who acknowledged Foster as the great influence on him. I've never heard him acknowledge Michelangelo or God or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a, a Tarzan comic book story that involved several panels of huge piles of gold ingots or something with lots of heavy black shadowing. And I remember when I brought the pages to Russ, he made some comment. He says, oh, you've been looking at Hogarth because I didn't use any white to separate the blacks. I've taken forever to make sure that it was all done by hand. So there were no, no white out. I know white out. Uh -huh. He said, you've been studying Hogarth. <laughs> well, you know, he did the one story in the newspaper strip where he brought back Daggerama, which was a character in a, in a, a story arc that Hogarth had done. And, and he said he did that as a tribute to Hogarth. He also did a, a, at least one tribute to the Foster. Remember uh, Prince Valiant? Uh, he falls under a spell. And, and oh, fuck, time. Fuck time, well, he had Tarzan. And, and I don't want to... Russ did do that as a tribute to Hogarth, but for a year and a half I said, why don't you bring back Daggerama? <laughs> <laughs> we, we waited longer to take him to Pelusin. <laughs> why why Russ never finish the Edgar Rice Bar's adaptations for a Why did he give it to other uh, Because he didn't have time doing both the daily and the comic strip that he wanted to devote all of his creative energies to. 
and there was no time to the mind. So there was, and, 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 and yeah, it, it, there just wasn't enough time. And I think it's uh, uh, 68, 69, or 70, and then. Really and in, 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 yeah. in, in 69, I think, is when I started working with Kirby. And, uh, and when did you start? 70? 69, 70? Uh, you talk more than me. Around 70 or 71. I know that there were a couple of uh, there were a couple of Tarzan books that I had something to do with, and there was a Magnus comic that uh, that he said he would do one more Magnus. I wrote it. He penciled four pages of it. I penciled about five pages worth at one panel on this page, two panels here. And Paul Norris did the rest, and then I had to ink and letter the book, and so it's it's kind of a Abortion, because it's not true to anybody. And for the longest time, Gold Key, Chase Craig wanted me to ink Paul Norris's Tarzan, and he said, but ink it the way you would ink Russ Manning. <laughs> and Chase never got the idea that Paul Norris and Russ Manning were worlds apart. And for several issues, I went ahead and inked Paul Norris as if I were inking Russ. And for me, it was I was just continuing. I was just this doctor in the back room performing these illegal operations. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't it wasn't true to Paul Morris, and it, and it was a uh, like a slam to Russ. I, I I guess I was lucky in a way when I when I started with Russ, I had no style of my own because the only comic book pages I'd ever done were aping Russ. So. I was kind of a blank tablet, and 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 so in a way, it, I lucked out going to work for Kirby because Jack says, ink my pencils, and since I had the style of my own, I inked his pencils, and it, it turned out right. And when I finally inked Paul Norris's pencils, I thought of well, Paul Norris, and someone asked Paul Norris once if he'd ever had an assistant, and he said, no, the closest I would ever say I came to an assistant were the books of mine and my priority. <coughs> I always wanted to, when the book came out to you, to look at it and go, oh, I have Paul pencil to this, Russ pencil to this, Jack pencil to this. And I got in trouble at Marvel doing two Don Heck Kazars because I ain't look like Don Heck. I got all the hell. They said, why didn't you make it look like Joe Sennett? And I said, well, you didn't offer to pay me. <laughs> so I was lucky. I had no artistic personality. So <laughs> did you guys work in a studio with him, or would you take pages home? I, I worked there. He, uh, mostly there. <coughs> I, I think it was two or three days ago. Initially with me, he, he gave me, I think, the first three that I did at home. And then he asked me, like, a oh, lot. Because there was just so much work to do and so behind. And I think I, I moved him there for about six, eight months. Amazingly, we drive the stuff up. Not all the time, but some of the time. And this, by that time, we were done with the uh, European books. And it was back to just the Sunday. And he caught up completely. And I think he recovered for some of these other things. I was just too far away and doing other things. And he, at that time, was, was doing. He always had like several lands in the fire once. It was never just the same strip. It was like Did you know how to work from that uh, uh, Oriana black and white? Yeah, yeah. Good work from uh, I did like three. See, I'm sitting here with two extremely talented guys who are known all over the world because of their work. I've been anonymous for 20 years, but it's probably okay. But what's interesting mm -hmm. is that you, the irony of comic books and things being backwards. I penciled two 12-page Tarzan comic book stories in that whole Burroughs publishing thing. And it should have been the other way around. And he inked one of them, or most of them. I think Russ did one page and some heads, and the rest of it, I believe, was your inking. Uh, uh, it was a story. It was back and forth. It was even like what I was doing. And he kept saying, the way I would ask him if he was 
Uh, we never found any of those. Also and what was great that. about the Joshua Trust is that uh, Russ was a, a real admirer of Warren Tufts. Mm -hmm. And I think that was Russ being Warren Tufts. I mean, you look at it and it's, it's pure Russ Manning, but it's not the Russ Manning of Magnus. It's not the Russ Manning of Tarzan. It's the Russ Manning thinking Warren Tufts. Mm -hmm. I have tried for 30 years to get those originals from Zeke. <laughs> and he keeps saying, we'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll talk. Didn't he also start a third one or contemplate a third one that was like a, a kind of a combination Prince Valiant Brothers of the Spear, where he had these two two princes go off into like 17 or 1800s Africa? Well, where does he see all this stuff? Yeah. What did we miss out? No, I'm not being facetious. I'm not, that's, you no, know these, are, these, are, these are from uh, copies of letters that Russ wrote to Vern Correa. Sorry, he discussed this. Well, these yeah. may have been ideas he discussed with the editors at uh, Western Publishing. Uh, he was a very organized person. Not that I remember. He showed his, his he kept every piece of fan mail that he got at the beginning. Mm -hmm. every, if you wrote him, then you had your own vanilla envelope with your name on it. <laughs> with your letters. He showed me, he showed me my envelope. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take him to respond to your first letter? Well, oh, it, it was a letter. Oh, exactly. I wrote it telling him you should hire me. Oh. I mean, <laughs> we're all in that weekend. Because so. uh, I sent him three pages of ink sample, well, you know, comic pages, your and <laughs> it was nine months before he answered. Mm. Well, maybe he didn't need you as an admin. He literally did that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but again, I mean, maybe he was afraid you'd come down like you did. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll tell you one thing about Russ. Be just no. one letter, and he never responded to it. Russ, Russ did speak his mind. So if he hadn't wanted me to work for him, he would have told me. Because I can remember after working with him for a year, my parents came down from my hometown of Oregon, 1,100 miles away, and I had taken stuff home that week because I was working daytime at Sherwin Williams Paint, evenings and weekends on the comic book stuff. And I had some pages to take back to him, so they rode with me. I walked into the house, and Russ is sitting in the kitchen, and I hand him the pages, he looks at them, and he says, that works. And then I said, say, would you like to meet my folks that are out in the car? And he went, no. <laughs> and, 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 and I, I, I didn't know what to say. I went, okay, well, I'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> But now, the older I get, I realize, I find myself in situations where people say, would you like to see this? And I go, no. <laughs> because it was the truth. So I may have moved into his backyard, but I feel that he, if he didn't want me there, he would have said, what are you doing, kid? Are you crazy? You know, he says, well, you're here. He says, yeah. And, and the first day, he gave me aliens. <laughs> but, uh, but after, uh, after saying that, he also would take time on a daily basis for people from his, his community who would just drop in on him. And that was just, I, I resented it and I didn't live there. You know, they, they just would milk his time he, because he would have to quit and sit and talk with them and they'd stay for an hour or two. And, and as soon as one person would leave, sure enough, within a half an hour or so, somebody else would come. What were they talking about? Before? Just the fundraiser for the fire department. Just shooting it. The pancake they breakfast on Saturday morning. They didn't have anything to say. It was just local, yeah. sitting out front of the general store. And a lot of times you didn't know exactly where Russ was coming from on a particular issue. Sometimes in, in, on morality, for instance. He told me once about a party he was at in the canyon. And some gal was flirting with him outrageously because he was, he didn't tell people he did comic books, he was an illustrator. And this gal apparently was, was yeah. <laughs> really, really coming on to him. And, and, and uh, I said, well, what happened? He says, well, he says, I didn't do anything because there's no time for it. <laughs> he never said that, he says, well, I'm a married man, or it's, it's, it's immoral. It was like, where would I get a There's no time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I never met anybody whose, whose daily schedule was so jammed with, with mm. just stuff. 
he was always either on his way to someplace or, or just coming back. And I would often be there by myself for hours and hours and hours before he would come back. And a lot of it was fire. Uh, Our two families went on a water skiing weekend to Lake Isabella. I never got so burned in my life. <laughs> And it was it was it was a fun day, you know. Went on the boat. Joe was out trying to water ski and laying on the sand and turning feet red. And we had it planned out on the way home. We were going to stop in this little town that we'd come through on the way to the lake and have lunch there. So my wife and I and the kids get there and we wait. <laughs> After two and a half hours, I went. Maybe he didn't say that. So we ordered. Just as we're finished. They drive up. <laughs> they arrived, and his response was, what, you ate, didn't wait for us? And it was now three hours. And he said, there was this neat little antique store in the town up the road. So on the one hand, there was never any time for anything. But I think there was, it was easy for him to totally lose track of time. So yes. we, we didn't meet him too much for dinner after that. <laughs> <laughs> but he also had his strongest I'd have, a, I'd have a cup in the morning, but if, if I made a mistake and had a second cup in the afternoon, my hands were well, I, I couldn't do that for a <laughs> And a couple spoonfuls of honey. I became addicted to Dr. Broner's corn and sesame chips, which you can't find anymore. But I still find myself walking into health food stores saying, you got Dr. Broner's corn and sesame chips? And they go, I've never heard of that. <laughs> But it was some sort of health food thing that we snacked on all the time in the studio. And, and the bag on the back had all kinds of political philosophizing by Dr. Broner. Uh, I got trail mix. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Big bowls of trail mix. Did Russ ever express an opinion of Frazetta? Because you know on the lot that he really created Frazetta's painting in pen and ink for that advertisement. That he, he, he liked Frank Scott. You know anything about, I saw some drawings by Russ once, they're from the early 50s, they were obviously a kind of presentation art for a John Carter from West Coast. Do you know anything about the story? Bob about? was. What <laughs> <laughs> about those Bob West channel? West channel. They're very early, I just, they're very early. Uh, I have those originals. Yeah. Wow. They, were, yeah. they were part of Russ's sample kit. Oh, wow. well, they weren't part of no, they've never been published. How come? How, how can we at the table get copies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all I have is a is a he, he drew the things three or four. They're an issue. Sure. They're herbed. And, and, and I and I've got yeah, one of the small issues. He's a Russ Manning issue. Extremely yellow Thermofax copies. He did two pieces of the. He did a cover and the inside cover, which you know they did the vignettes of the heads of the characters, and and then he did a couple of interior pages, all adapted from chess memoirs. Yeah, question back there. I was going to ask about the bar soon. Could uh, each of you gentlemen maybe tell us a little more about if you had professional experience before you came to Russ, um, about how old were you, where were you in your life, and what was your next professional gig after Russ? Can I ask you to hold that thought while you change tapes? <laughs> <laughs> Russ's first letter to Vernon Coriel, he drew a picture of Tarzan on a very primitive looking Tarzan and, and his comment underneath okay. it was, I might as well do Tarzan everybody else is. <laughs> Actually, this was in 1947. Wow. It was Camille Castasu that encouraged me to move into Russ's backyard. I got a letter from Kaz saying that he had been to Southern California, he visited Russ, that Russ had said some nice things about the sample pages that I'd sent him, although I hadn't heard from Russ yet. He says, if I were you, Mike, he said, I would just move down there into his backyard. Easy for him. So it's, it's Kaz's. Well, if he hadn't done it, he wouldn't have got the It's Kevin's following me, too, because uh, I done a whole slew of illustrations after I'm a Barbarian came out. And then Kessler sat on them for several years. But finally published them. And when he published them, Russ saw them and liked them. 
this one in particular that I had done. And uh, call me up to see if I would uh, consider assisting on the school. Mm -hmm. That was how I got the gig. And then after uh, the rest, I worked under uh, Kurtzman and Elder on uh, Low Landing Field. Mm -hmm. But at, at the same time, I was working for Russ and Elder. I was all doing my own stuff. Well, I don't know how old day, but I guess you could say we got our professional starts. But... So if it wasn't for Tarzan and Russ Manning, I wouldn't be. Was more books that you did. I'd still be self screening signs for that construction company in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> so how old were you when you, when you first started? You said that it was kind of a parental influence on how old were you? So 24. I was uh, 24. Six months, I hired a 40-hour <laughs> <laughs> salary from an animation studio with Gold Key and Russ. 
Uh, how long did so it took me 11 months before I was well, earning a living full time. Less than a year, that's great. It's taken me 35 years to learn anything about growing. I'm a little slower than these guys. <laughs> I, I went to uh, the Yankee Art Institute in 1967. It was now known as Cal Arts. And uh, I was an illustration major. And at the school, they had this wonderful policy, which was if you got any professional work, you could turn that in and move your homework assignments. So in 1968, I began illustrating a pulp magazine called Cover 13, which was uh, fiction and short stories about uh, witchcraft, supernatural vampires, and stuff. And uh, so at, at age 19, I began supporting myself in my art. And never stopped. Uh, it made a transition from school to the real world very easy. By, by my last year in school, every assignment I was turning in was. Well, I did a lot of other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of other stuff. You know, cost of living was last show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No family yet. Yeah, was, yeah well, my apartment was like 90 bucks or whatever. Uh, I was, let's see, I was right out of high school. I went to City College in San Diego for about two years. And then I got the, the game of trust, and then uh, I believe before I, I went to work for him, I was doing local ad art, advertising mostly. Uh, and I was doing that during high school as well. So I guess I, I wasn't supporting myself because I was still living at home, but as soon as I got the job for Russ, that was enough that it didn't I was going to go all the time. And uh, I must have been able to put away something because immediately after that I moved to Van Nuys and started working on cheap low budget films. Actually, what really helped me was very much so cheap low budget films. I had a job at Disneyland. I did uh, watercolor projects out in Orleans Square. And it was a uh, commission job. The more projects you did, the more money you made. I became the fastest portrait artist, and I was doing over 80 portraits a day. And, uh, so I was making enough money, basically, to live for about three quarters of a year, just in that, that short summer time. And, uh, oh, yeah, they had a, they had a, well, I think they still do, they have a policy against long hair. And, and so the, the second summer that I worked there, the first summer I got a haircut, the second summer that I worked there, I wore a short hair wig. <laughs> I my long hair underneath the wig. <laughs> oh, you were the one. That was beauty. Was it obvious? Uh, yeah, eventually, yeah, I got sloppy and became obvious. I got caught. <laughs> Maybe so. That was my first contact with uh, Scott Shaw. He, he recognized my signature on, on the portraits from the Cover 13 stuff, and he asked me to be a, a guest at the second uh, San Diego Comic Con. He ran into me at Disney. Jack was there. Yeah. Well, Jack and I were both the first Shaw Shaw. Actually, the first one wasn't real. It was. What was that called? Like a garage? It was like, this is what we want to do, and the next year would be the first one. No. It wasn't the first one that the college No. I think that was the third one. That was when I, that was when I became aware of exactly what co-ed housing was. And I walked into the restaurant. It's like checking out the fountain, the famous fountain in the men's room at the Madonna Inn. It's also a tourist attraction. It's very disconcerting when you're using the facility to have a couple of blue-haired old ladies come and go, isn't that nice? And think that maybe they're not talking about the statue. <laughs> 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 On the day, any chance we'll see some Burroughs art from you? Come on, I don't know what for. I mean, it's never come up. A lithograph or uh, Well, I don't know, because you have to license the character. You can use the trademark. You can't do a log. 
Well, I'm sure I could, but yeah. Uh, but we do it. What would you do with it? Exactly. Yeah, would it you use it? <laughs> yeah, more flash for that. I don't know. There's always a way to possibly use it. You don't have any comment at all on uh, the possibility of uh, continuity script, adventure script coming back to the paper. Any, any thoughts about that at all? You think it's over? And you think the script yeah, will keep getting smaller? Chances of snowflake in hell. I think we ought to ask it's Tom. It's snowflake. I'm doing a Zorro newspaper script. I've heard that, but I haven't seen it anywhere. Well, we got six papers. Oh, okay. And the syndicate's excited. They think it's great. <laughs> What's they think it's it? It's the uh, creators. They do uh, Archie and uh, what's it? Not the Yeah, they do uh, the um, Liberty Medals. They told the uh, people who own Zorro that they have to be willing to lose it, to, to lose money on it for a year before it, they know if it, if it finally might work or not. Well, they might go. Well, they have to write it off for a year as a loss. Well, but if it goes, then you've got something happening. And they were it was the syndicate's idea. They approached the people who own Zorro and said, we want to
and I use that to fund my fine art painting. You know, I've been working, it seems like now forever, on a book uh, which when it's finished will be the first visual history of life in Antarctica from the historic times to the present day. I've spent a lot of time down there, and I've got a few more trips planned down there every year. And uh, so the book shows both the prehistoric Antarctica and contemporary life. <coughs> I draw Winnie the Pooh and Tigger for the Disney stores. <laughs> Mickey Mouse and Donald, Beauty and the Beast, whatever the assignment is. A concept, merchandise, product art, and then take my concept or other people's concepts and make them work. Did Unfortunately, most of what I do winds up being embroidered. I <laughs> do <laughs> <laughs> embroider ah. Embroidered. Did you do anything with the Disney Tarzan? Hmm? Did you do anything for Disney Tarzan? No, no. Totally different division. I, I spent 14 years on staff and creative for consumer products licensing, and the last six years I've been freelancing mostly for creative at the Disney stores. And they're creative people, I use the word in quotes, <laughs> uh, because the creative people there are still overruled by buyers whose basic concern is that in Singapore they have a dock with three million t-shirts with a pocket right here, what can we put on it? And so I've, I've spent the last six years, I have a collection of concepts that in the next couple of weeks I'm going to start showing the licensees that do silk screen and subject static. I've done some stuff that I was pretty damn proud of and knew that would leap off racks, except they were never produced by the stores because they were too involved for embroidery. Bless their hearts, they buy everything I do, whether they produce it or not, which is nice. So 20 years of mice and ducks and bears. <laughs> yeah, I've been painting uh, murals for Animal Kingdom. And, uh, and I did all the character design for upcoming Disney animated feature on the dinosaurs. Uh, I just heard the space to come out on Memorial Day. They just, they just finished wrapping the live action location for the children in Long Pine. And last October, I did a one day horseback ride over there with a shot on the and so on. And they were supposed to have finished the Disney film the week before we got there. And they were still there. And the production office was set up in the hotel. And this is last October. And I was just over there last weekend in the rocks. And somebody said, Yeah, Disney just pulled out last week. Yeah, I, I think that's a real ambitious day. They couldn't have picked a better place to shoot the live action stuff than in those rocks. In fact, if anybody here likes to ride horses and would like to ride with the Chef Gungadin and charge a lot of the tremors and bad day at Black Rock and have a couple on cast videos and Joe Kidd, etc., see me after the panel. We'll get your name and address for the mailing list. It's a hell of a day, Dave. Eight hours in the south. Yeah, we didn't shot around around here. No, nope, we shot in Lone Pine. That's 206 miles from the Disney Studio to my house in Simi Valley. I've seen and that movie about 50 times. You remember the movie Kim? Sir. Yep. Remember the movie Kim shot entirely in India? <laughs> yeah. That's 206 miles. <laughs> Errol Flynn was offered King Solomon's Mines or Kim. And since he'd been to Africa, but had never been to India, he chose Kim. And every bit of his footage was shot in the studio and alone. Mm -hmm. uh, which way is that? Where do each of you live? It's on Highway 395 between, uh, 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 it's hard to say, it's south of Mammoth. Everybody from the Los Angeles area said to the to Mammoth and Ski says, oh yeah, I've driven through alone. But two miles outside of town is where they've shot zilly, well, several hundred classic and non-classic oh, I, I was over know. there last Saturday night, and we had the first public screening in 79 years of the very first motion picture shot there. It was a paramount big deal epic starring Wallace Berry and Fatty Arbuckle called The Roundup. And it was a silent film, and uh, a musician composed the score, played it on the piano. We were out in the rocks <laughs> where they filmed the first Lone Ranger ambush in 1938. 
I, I think that would be needless to see how many, what pictures were shot there, what pictures were shot at Vasquez Rocks, and what pictures were shot in Rocks at Camp you know, <laughs> Tarzan's Desert Mystery Shot in the sand dunes in Alancha, which is 22 miles south of Lone Pine, and in the rocks in the Alabamas. So there is an EOB, EOB connection to everything we talk about. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, Russ did some designs for a t-shirt company. Whatever happened to those designs, you guys? Seven or eight drawings. I vaguely remember, but I have no idea. It's a long time ago. saw the t-shirt? He did a lot of diverse things. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm still kind of amazed. <laughs> That is his work kind of uh, split off in so many different directions. And, and a lot of it, people today still haven't seen it. You know, it's, it's, if you collect his work, it's hard to get all of it. I still have the flyer for the Jester Canyon Fire Department of Pancake Breakfast. Mountains and Sunrise. And there was, there was a script that he did, which was a Tarzan birthday present to Bob Hodes, and all of those kinds of things. Do you know for us like the further adaptations that were done by others for a Did you look at them, like them, be them? Well, I've been a Doug Wildy fan since I saw his first Saints for the out of town newspaper when I was a kid. And then when I saw my first Johnny Quest and I saw his name, I said, that's the guy that did the Saints. And then in 66 in Marvel Superheroes, I got to work with Doug. And listen to him in 1966 complain about how rough the Windsor Newton Series 7 number 3 brushes had gotten. No. And, and God, if we could buy today those crummy brushes of 66. Yeah. So did Russ like Doug's work? Or did he pay much attention to his own or something? I, 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 I think that. I know they liked each other. Yeah, yeah. Profession. Huh? I know that he, he, he did see the stuff. I do know that. Yeah. Really different stuff. You knew Doug very well. Yeah. Probably better than any of us here in the room. My memories of Doug is that he was, uh, had the same kind of personality traits that, uh, Sometimes that Harlan Ellison exhibits. You either, you, no, you either, no, in a conversation, you either no. love the guy or you hate the guy. Walk out. <laughs> I mean, well, I can remember sometimes. sitting in a room and tossing insults back and forth with Doug, but you knew that Doug wasn't serious. He was just having fun and seeing how how far you might go with it. You know, and I think he respected you if you threw back. Sure. You gave Maybe Harlan was the wrong competitor, and Storenko used to be that way. Actually, uh, a lot of people misread Doug, and, and because he was so salty and so crusty and, and loud, you, know, you could hear him coming down the hall. Um, yeah, and there, there, were, there were a few guys that stomped out of there and walked into Bill Hanna's office and where he's called out. He just he was a sort of cross between William Demarest and Lee Marlin. <laughs> Very interesting, great guess. Well, I remember him making comments like, why spend so much time to draw? Just use a photograph. That's good. That's what I was going to say. He used a lot of uh, Tarzan stills. But you models. know, he did it so damn well. I render it. I, I saw very little of his pencils, but it was a very faint outline in blue. And then he would use his photographic reference and take that, probably Windsor Newton number four, and he could do the finest line and a nice Pepsi blue line with that big brush. And then he could completely uh, construct something without the reference that he wanted to. That was the, the amazing thing about it. He did a lot of that in his presentation stuff. Didn't yeah, you? The, the photo referencing hadn't ruined it as an artist. And a lot of guys, it ruins. Uh, guys like Jacob just complain about it all the time. They, they use too much of it and they feel like it crushed their Drawing them out, yeah, same. Um, but uh, <coughs> he could just hit the ground, and, and he'd have a horse, he'd have a rider, he'd have you know buckboard, he'd have everything. So, so he would compose it in blue pencil, real rough, where the element's going to go. But he wouldn't really pencil it tight to the pencil. He would, 
I think he did it a lot of different ways. When I when I, I saw a star in comic books, and yeah, they were very loose. They were very loose. So he he looked at the photo of, of Johnny on the uh, uh, on the back of the rhino. He just draw a bear and uh, put him on a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just kind of happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, he had a really good uh, ability to recall what he had in his files, you know, as far as the scrap. Yeah, that's a great and trick. He, he, he would call it up time. immediately. He knows, yeah. oh yeah, I've got this shot, I can use it here. Mm -hmm. And he would compose his pages ahead right. of time, knowing mm -hmm. what yeah. shots he was going to use. Do you remember the Ron Ely Tarzan TV comics? That he did, yeah. Well, I had the interesting assignment on what would have been the last Gioetti Ron Ely comic book. They gave me all oh, 22 or 26 pages, and because they, the TV Tarzan had been selling that well, they wanted it turned into a core act. So I went through the entire book, and every Tarzan was changed to. Right. Not an imitation Gioetti, but it had to be Russ's correct. <laughs> no, Stuck it in the middle of the Gioetti artwork. The, the, the faces are changed to the figure. The whole body. The whole body. Huh? That, that was an interesting design. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I like to see that. It's kind of a different world now. A lot of interesting people have worked in the, in the Tarzan comics. Uh, I understand that. Gioetti, who was a kid, I loved his Sergeant Preston comic books. And he did work in India and Chief. And uh, Gioetti was Italian. His wife was from New York. He didn't speak or read English. So she translated all of the scripts. All of the lettering was done with the Leroy lettering set. I don't know, maybe by her? Where did he live? He came out the West Coast. He did a lot of stuff in Italy. All the rocks and garden. Unless you've heard of the so that's all I've ever heard. I think Al Williamson is the only guy I've ever known that ever spoke to him. Because Al used to use his, uh, his backgrounds. His backgrounds. His backgrounds. Oh, yeah. There's rocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody could draw rocks up to the and, and as a kid, the, his comics, the only thing that bothered me was the Leroy lettering. If it's not lettered by hand, it should all be organic. I mean, he, Russ and I have talked about that once. He said, well, if we really wanted it all to be by hand, then it should be like Kelly. We should not even rule the orders. They should all be done freehand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, I've got one question for you, Mike. One of the last stories that you did that the uh, Boris Incorporated it was something called the Island of Astor. Do you remember that? Did that start on the boot? Is the Tarzan? I did two. I did two stories: the Search for New and the Torag Queen. I penciled one of them, and Russ and Dave inked it. That was the uh, uh, Torag Queen, and the other one, the Search for New. I wound up. Penciling, inking, lettering, the whole thing. No, but this story started out as a, as a Tarzan and Captain Nemo. And oh. it it out. So then they changed, they changed the name of uh, Captain Nemo and the Northwest to something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like Don Hoover. I don't. Yeah, think I don't I, think I don't think you wrote it. I don't think I was involved in that. that. You did a couple for it. Huh? You did a couple for it. Name it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but there was so much material going in and out of Russ's place during that time, and they had so many different <coughs> artists sort of pushed in. Um, it was tough to keep track of who was going to die because Russ would try to put together the creative team for each one of his stories himself. And you would have one guy laying out if he didn't have time to do four pencils, and you'd have another guy coming in to finish pencils, and maybe make it for another guy. And it got pretty confusing. On top of that, you had Russ going over everything, trying to put his spin on it. And I, as I recall, I think that story was penciled by Danny Colonati, I think. And then I, I believe Russ might have done something. But the, the cover, I, I got the cover, and it was, it was either penciled by Hobart, I think by you. 
Well, if it were penciled by Holberg, I would never ink anything he penciled. I'll tell you one thing, the tapes are so not on. Yeah, your name's on it. <laughs> well, that's like I used to. I used to fighting like a big. I used to pick up Lo Pinon at the newsstand just because I wanted to see Tarzan in Spanish, and every daily strip was signed M R, which was the initials of the translator. <laughs> I still, to this day, if I am going through some sort of stress, I have this reoccurring nightmare. <laughs> where I drive out to Majesca Canyon and Russ is sitting at the drawing board and he says, don't tell anybody, I'm still here. And, you know, I'm not gone. And he hands me a stack of stuff and says, increase. Tomorrow. And, and then I'm in an office somewhere and an editor is saying, you know this stuff is late because you haven't finished it yet. And then I wake up in a cold sweat because I'm still picking up work for us and it's late. <laughs> I call it a nightmare in quotes. It's just interesting because they're just so vividly real and in color. And he's not in the new studio that was built off of the barn. It's the little house under the trees on the hillside, you know. And he's, he's sitting in a board that's elevated. <laughs> he me these papers. This, this is a question for either Mike or Dave, but uh, can you say anything about how this gentleman named Wolf and his Animedia was involved with the European comics? Everything went through Burn Wolf's Animedia. Had an office in the second floor of the building on Riverside, uh, Riverside right next to uh, Rex Allen's office. I know that because I cornered Rex in the hall and had him autograph a portrait of him drawn. Now, now Bird Wolf, Bird Wolf and Anamedia is one that Russ did the pet food stuff for. Ah, oh, okay. I haven't I haven't seen Bernie in about three years. When I when I was on staff at Disney, I used to have lunch at least three days a week at Sardo's on pass between Alameda and Oak. And Bernie and his wife usually had lunch in there. And we would, you know, exchange pleasantries and how's things going and do you ever see such and such. And I think the last time I saw him was three years ago because I only eat at Starbucks once every two months now. I don't come into town. Yeah, I wrote the Soul of the 17th Gate script for the European Post, but Tarzan and Palatine script. As soon as I sold it, then the, the books were canceled. So. Oh, wait, good. Still got it? I still got it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, was, I was going to be the pen star anchor as well. But oh, no, no. Get to Dr. Mike. Russ gave Bird Wolf and his wife, uh, presented them with his cover for Tarzan and the Glorious. Oh. Where the girl's sitting on the throne, the emanating rays of light, he's yeah. filing these. That was is that the second part of uh, Land of Time for that? I worked on that one. No, I was for the part that we did. You work on the Glorious? Yeah. What? Yeah. And I got a poster of the yeah. cover someplace. It was written by. Um, I just I just bought the cover from Bird Wolf. Oh. Well, that answers the question. Burns still around. <laughs> well, when you see him next, say hello for me. I don't go to Sargos anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, your your nightmare about the the pile of. My nightmare is being stuck on the freeway, having to deliver this stuff to Uber at 5 p.m. and it's rush hour, and I'm, I'm, my car is overheating, and I can't get any place, and I know they got to mail it out at the end of that day. <laughs> I, I can't play any time to have to from Russ's place to Riverside Road. Oh, I know on my last 17 or 18 weeks with Russ, when he was doing the last of the Sunday Tarzans, and doing the daily and Sunday. He called me up and he said, I want you to work with me on these. And I said, well, no, how? Like before, he says, no, I will give you pencils, you will letter me, you will be responsible for the total finish. And I said, this means that I will have work all week long. <laughs> of course, in that 17 week or 19 week period, I never, it never did come in a steady flow. 
we got it done somehow. But I, for a while, would deliver them into the, the Star Wars into Black Falcon, which was their office when they were in the A Company building across the interest of Universal. But uh, the first few weeks, he mailed in. And the first three weeks of the strip, I think it was the first three weeks, maybe it was the first six weeks, were lost. Never showed up. But fortunately, since he had negatives, we took the stats, and by that time, they decided to make the strip a half an inch longer. So on those three or six weeks of stats, there was a little more hard on it. But when he asked me to ink and letter everything, I said, well, <clears throat> do I get originals? Because <laughs> now it will be like, as the ink or letterer, I should get a third of that art. And he said, you can't have anything on the tarp. Of course, he did wind up. He did get it. He said, Star Wars, no problem. But of course, the first six weeks were stats. So I got 